pulling up your soda into your mouth so you can drink it. You're creating a low pressure area in your mouth and the higher pressure area of the atmosphere is pushing down on that fluid and pushing it back up into your mouth. Now, a straw is a good, uh, good example. How big a straw do you use? Oh, regular size, you know. <laughs> well, regular size nowadays is about, what, 5 sixteenths? Inside diameter? So, uh, those, those of us who have a few more years, uh, the earliest straws that I remember were only about an eighth of an inch in diameter. Little guys. And uh, you're drinking uh, malt with it. Uh, that malt is so thick that it's hard to get anything up that straw. So they started giving us two straws. And then eventually they went to the larger straw. Well, what they're doing is they're recognizing that you are uh, moving a material through that passage and the larger the diameter of your straw, the larger the diameter of your passage, the easier it is for that material to flow through there. Now you've got the same problem with your lathe. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on the vacuum system itself. I'm going to concentrate more on how to use it. But uh, the design and usage of the vacuum system is a little bit more sophisticated than most people understand. So if you're really wanting to get into it, come talk to me or go online to the American Blue Turner and, and look up some of the articles that I wrote that are in there. Now, when I started, uh, I agreed to do this demo. Uh, I was going to do a demo similar to what I did about four years ago. I went back and looked at the articles that I wrote, and those articles were obsolete. I have learned so much since then that uh, I'm going to show you tonight that uh, makes things a lot easier. And the other thing that happened is that uh, when they put out the newsletter, um, they put my write-up in there, but I didn't send them any pictures. So they went out and dug up some of the old photos, and they had a picture of this trivet with offset inlay work, which is totally unrelated to vacuum chucking. <laughs> well, I accepted the challenge. I'll show you how to do it vacuum chucking tonight. Okay? Now, a lot of us, we will have, at this point, our, uh, our bowl that we've gotten finished turning. And we want to turn it around and take the tin off the pole. So one of the challenges is that when we put it on that vacuum chuck, we've got to get it oriented right. Anybody ever had that problem getting it lined up just right so that it doesn't wobble? How many different ways are there to do that? Well, if you only know one way to do it, you're limiting yourself. There are about a half a dozen different ways of winding this thing up. Where's my go? Now, if you're lucky, but when you did turn your tenon, when you finished up, you still have a point on the bottom of your tenon that shows you where the center is. Okay, how many have ever turned a tenon and it was too thick to go on the jaw right? Nobody? Yeah. Oh, okay. So when it, when it won't go down there, you wind up cutting it off. You just lost your reference point. So how do you do it now? How do you get your reference point if you didn't, uh, didn't go back and redo that? Well, uh, where it went. One of our club members who were remained nameless 
was over at my place and I talked about using a center fighter. And I pulled this thing out. I says, what's that? <laughs> okay, for those of you who don't know, I know all of you guys know, but, uh, this is 45 degrees and this is centered. So you can take this and put it on there and see it? You can draw a line down through there, rotate it, draw another line, and rotate it and draw another line just in case you got a little bit of wobble. So then you can take the average of where they cross and you got a center point. Okay? What's another way? I'm a tool judge. <laughs> Uh, there are other ways of doing it. Uh, one way is if you want to spend the money uh, to take your chuck. And they're very willing to sell you these things. This is not a live center. It's rather solid. If you can put that on there, And now you can put your chuck on there with your bowl on the chuck. Then you can get it properly centered onto your huh. vacuum chuck or on there. Okay? Now if you don't want to spend the money, you can make another tool for yourself that'll work. Okay, we have this. You've got this uh, chuck on here. Now, incidentally, when you guys do your turning, uh, I know you always put reference marks on your tenons, don't you, so you can put them back if you have to? Everybody does that, right? Okay. So, I always mark pin one, or chuck one, jaw one. There it is. And I put that on there. And I can tighten that up. And I know that this is centered with that bowl, right? Okay. Now, you can grab some scrap wood and make one of these things, or you can go out to craft supply, whoever has them. And uh, this fits right in there like that. Then we got some center punch. And you put that down in there and tap it, and now you got your center mark. Okay, so far? There's still another way. Yes? What's good? John, on your, on your little adapter you have here, there's a hole on the end of that. You can either a little set of uh, center points or even uh, like one of the tips from the multiple uh, uh, lock centers. They'll fit right in there, and you can thread them in, and it'll do the same thing. You'll get them exactly on. Yes. So that's the hole at the end of that. Okay. The main thing is be inventive. Think about it. Uh, a book I read several years ago was talking about engineering, and uh, the guy was an engineer during World War II doing uh, uh, microwave relay work and uh, different types of electronics. And he made the statement that uh, all breakthroughs in engineering come from taking something from that area and applying it over here. And you can cross fertilize on these things and you can make a lot of progress. Okay. This now is the vacuum chuck on here. Now I know from past experience that if I'm going to mount a vacuum chuck, uh, on my spindle that if I don't do something to help it, it's going to leak. So all this is is Teflon tape and I'll typically put about three layers on there. It, it all depends upon what chuck I'm using and uh, how much wear and tear I've got on things. Question? It's just standard plumbing um, Teflon tape if you go down to uh, 
Home Depot, they've got really good high quality stuff. Or if you're a cheapskate, like I am, I'm going to go over to uh, uh, Harbor Freight and buy 10 rolls instead of five. Okay? Now, let's put us a chuck on there. I've got several chucks. Um, this one is a commercial chuck. Uh, it's designed to fit a uh, two inch PVC coupling in here. It's got an O-ring. You uh, take it and you set it in there carefully and you, you tighten up the screws to hold it in place and you put a marker on it. The way this is intended, now this is a two by four coupling. They make two by three, they make uh, two inch. You can get all sorts of different sizes. So by one, buying one adapter, you can put multiple sizes in there. So you mark it as to where it's at, and then when you mount it on your lathe, uh, there we go. You mount the thing on there, and one of the first things you do is you screw the thing up. There it is. And you notice that mm -hmm. that tape makes it a little bit tight. Yes. That's okay. Okay. So when you first build your chuck, uh, you bring your uh, tool rest over here, and when you spin this thing, it's going to wobble just a little bit. So you use a scraper, smooth it up, and round it over a little bit. Then you put your uh, sealant on there, your gasket material. And depending upon what you want to do, you can spend a lot of money on that gasket material. Did cheapskate. This is what I use. That's a craft foam. And I get down at um, I get at Michael's or Hobby Lobby. It's got uh, an Gordon. adhesive on the back side. What's that? I'm trying to get someone to hold it. They have different colors, but I stick with the white. Uh, I don't know that it would, but I want to make sure that if something slips, it doesn't uh, stain the wood. And uh, white works, so I stick with it. Okay, now uh, what I do is I cut strips of that stuff and I'll take a marker and put a mark on the chuck so I have a straight line and I just start wrapping it around there. Uh, now, if it doesn't go all the way around, that's okay, I'll put another piece on there. I found out that if you wipe these things over, uh, I want to lap them over about a sixteenth of an inch <coughs> that it gets a good seal. If I lap for more than that, it doesn't compress enough and it, I don't necessarily get a good seal. Uh, this one, I think I cut the strip about an inch and a half and uh, you notice on the inside it's starting to release. I've been experimenting with going to the full two inches on like on this one, and it seems to work a little bit better, but it's not perfect. Um, the other day, I found out that a popsicle stick fits in there real nice, so I put a, several popsicle sticks in there into the whole place. Okay, I've got my vacuum chuck on there. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the vacuum system. We'll over here the drawing. What most people do is they have a vacuum pump and from the vacuum pump that goes into a filter and then I have what's called an isolation valve that I put in here. Most people don't have that. Then you go into a manifold, the manifold where everything splits out. So you've got a vacuum gauge on there, you've got a bleeder valve and then you've got another hose going over to your rotary vacuum adapter and that goes through the spindle and it goes to your chuck. Any questions so far? 
Now, my being an engineer, I try all sorts of weird things. Now, I put this large uh, vacuum gauge on there and have it sitting over there just so you guys can see what's going on. You don't have to believe me, you can see it yourself. Okay, then there's another one here that's on the uh, end of the adapter, rotary adapter. It's not needed, but it's there. Then I get a lot of questions about this tank. Uh, I put that tank on there again because I'm uh, experimenting with different ways of doing stuff and I have found that in some cases it's a big advantage. Because what will happen in a lot of cases with people is they will take their bowl and they'll stick it up here on their vacuum chuck and then start off the pump and wait for it to build up a vacuum to grab the thing and hold it in place. And the difference to that is that I close this isolation valve. Here's the isolation valve I have. Now this valve over this gauge over here, if Carmel can see it, this gauge is what the coming off the vacuum pump, and this one is on the manifold. And if we have low uh, low volumes of air traveling around, then this gauge, this one, and that one should match. Now, these are uncalibrated, so they're going to vary a little bit, but they'll represent each other. Okay. Being an engineer, I want to know that my equipment is working right. Uh, so the first thing I do when I put my chuck on there, I will start off the top. And this is going to go up to about 20, 21 inches of mercury eventually. If everything works right. Now, you can see it, this little green valve down here goes into the hose that goes down underneath. I've got a uh, couple pieces of 4 inch PVC pipe in there that I'm using for the uh, vacuum reservoir, that tank down there. You can get along perfectly well without it. But uh, I like it. You're going to help me. Come here. Okay. I want you to hold this in place. Put your, put your finger right here. Okay? Got it? Okay. Now I'm going to turn on the back then. Feel it? Yeah. What do you feel? feel I can feel it in there. Just ever so slight. It was fast, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. Now, what that does is that, that illustrates that there's a force going into there against that uh, vacuum tube. Now, that force uh, is what's going to help us keep our stuff in place. Now, the... That's good. Uh, I need to get over here where I can read my numbers. Uh, I calculated that at 15.9 inches of surface on there. We're running about 20, 21 inches of mercury. Uh, each inch of mercury is about one and a half PSI. So if you think of it as 20 inches, then uh, you've got about 10 pounds per square inch pressure differential between the outside and the inside. We do not have a perfect vacuum inside. But there's a differential there. So, uh, 10 PSI times 15.9, oh, what have we got? About 160 pounds pushing on that. Quite a bit, isn't it? Okay. Uh, be careful when you do this test and you put your piece on there. Uh, a friend of mine, came over and we did a lot of stuff in the vacuum system. He went on to his system and he went to do this test. So this is a cover sheet off of an old cake pan. Well, he didn't have an old cake pan with a cover on it. So he went out to the kitchen and see what he could find. And he found this nice old saucer. 
and he brought it down here and he put it on there and put the thing and tested it and had to apologize to his wife. He broke it. So yes, in some cases, your items that you mount on there, if they're very thin, very fragile, uh, you may want to use your bleeder valve up here and you can bleed off some of the air and you can control the vacuum that's occurring over here. Any questions so far? Okay. I know my vacuum system is working, but how well is it working? So the next thing I do, and I take and close that isolation valve. I close this valve right here at this point. So that isolates the pump from the rest of this. So whatever volume I've got in there is going to hold the vacuum and it's eventually going to leak out. So the question I've got is how fast is it going to leak? Let's we'll find out. It's leaking. You see it? That needle is moving a little bit. Uh, I've got fresh gas material on here. The first time I did this, this plate fell off in about 15 to 20 seconds. And I said, oh, I've got some challenges. So I went off and did some work with it and figured out how to make it work better. And this will stay here 10, 15, 20 minutes right now. So that I know that when I am working with my bowl, from here to the vacuum pump, everything's okay. Any leakage I've got, any problems I've got, is with the piece of wood I've got. How about that? I don't see any cracks. Any questions so far? All this is is a health check, just to find out how good my system is. Because all wood is porous, they will all leak, and it's just a matter of how much they're leaking. Okay? And I need to know how much they're leaking so that I can uh, say that I'm being uncomfortable with what I'm doing or I'm in danger. Oh, it finally came off. Everybody awake? There it is. Okay. Depending upon how I'm feeling and so forth, I go through a lot of tape because I generally figure out that I have to put new tape on here every time. And that will leak at this joint right here quite a bit. And there are various ways of isolating the leaks and testing them out. Okay, remember all those different ways we talked about about finding out Oh, not this thing is centered. Okay, so we can put this thing on here. And I've got a nice little hole there which makes it easy to get into that stead center. And now I can turn the vacuum back on and it comes up. I don't know about you guys, but I don't like turning vacuum pumps or motors off and on all the time. Matter of fact, I found out that if I leave, if I close this thing down like that, and I turn off the pump, and I still have vacuum on there, I turn the pump off and stall. So, rule of thumb, always have the vacuum off of your pump whenever you turn the pump off. Okay, so we're, you see that we're only pulling about 15 inches of mercury on there. With our test plate, uh, we had 20, 21 inches. So where is the leaking? Where? The wood itself. The wood itself? What about the space between the wood and the uh, vacuum shop? That gasket in there. How many of you have noticed that after you got through doing your bowl and everything, you took it off, there's a layer of dust in there? 
That happens. So uh, the sawdust and everything will leak into there. That's why we have the filter up here to protect our pump. Okay. Now, if I was real concerned about this, uh, this leaking, the first thing I would do is I would reach down to the floor and grab a handful of sawdust and start sprinkling it in there, right in here. And quite often, uh, that will make a few inches difference. Just, just let that sawdust help you out a little bit. What's another way we can help it? You ever hear of wood sealer? <coughs> Nobody here has ever heard of wood sealer. Wow, what a bunch of woodwork. You can coat this with wood sealer, and that will help. But I will also tell you that you don't want to do it with it on the vacuum truck with your pump running. Um, It'll do a real good job of sucking that sealer into the pores of the wood, but if it's real bad, you might contaminate your pump, which is not a good deal. Uh, what's another way? Remember, you want to do more and have more than one tool to use for solving problems. What's another way? Anybody got any masking tape? <laughs> Okay, I see a few people nodding their head. Um, some people, will, they, they have a uh, knot or a, a feature on their wood that's got a little crack in it. You can take put a piece of masking tape on it. Okay? Not what you have to do. See this stuff? You can take that and wrap it around there and tuck it in, put a piece of uh, masking tape on it, hold it in place. And depending upon what your leak is, it may help. Okay? Uh, now, if you got that wrap on there, now you want to turn off your tendon. Your bull cow doesn't care. It'll cut right on through that rat. Now, those of you who have used vacuum chucking systems, have you ever noticed that the vacuum level here will go up while you're sanding it? You ever notice that? Watch, next time you do it. This will typically increase because all that sanding dust will start clogging up your pores. Okay, let me show you one other thing real quick. Um, there is another way you can use to center your piece on the light. You got a tool rest, we're going to use it as a gauge. Now, what we can do is that we can move this up here. what I'll do is I'll be using the step center. How many of you are familiar with step centers? Okay, you know that center pin is spring-loaded. Okay, you can take that spring-loaded pin and put it on there and it'll hold your piece in place, but you don't have to engage the whole thing. So all you're doing is using that spring-loaded system to hold it in place. Now what you do is you bring your tool rest up here and you will turn your bowl around Oh, this is too good. I'm going to have to mess it up. Okay, the lovely... I'm holding it with the spring. Now I'm going to back this off a little bit. Okay. Now it's off center, right? And just using the spring load of that pin to hold it in place. Now I can... What I'll do is I'll typically... Uh, just a little bit of vacuum on here, about five inches if I can. Takes a little bit of anesthetized. <coughs> so 
so somewhere in that neighborhood. The idea of it is it applies enough force to hold it in place, but yet I can still move it. So what we do is we bring our uh, measuring tool up here, and we find out where it's the closest. Like right about there. Okay. Now I take that closest spot and move it over to the other side. And now I've got a gap. So all I have to do is bring my adjustment tool up here. I usually have a mallet at home. Okay. I move it over halfway. So if I did it right, we're going to be closer to bring balance. That's close enough. Any questions? Remember, try to think of more than one way to do a particular task. You can only think of one way, uh, you've got an opportunity. Any questions so far? Yeah. How often do you what? How often do you have I've never cleaned it. <laughs> okay, now I I did some walking online in various places and I could never find a recommendation as to what the characteristics that told me to do. It never had. Yeah. Let me digress a bit from that. Okay. Um, when I bought this, I bought the top and a kit which had the manifold one or two valves. I had to buy a bunch more because I'm crazy. It had the filter. It had one gauge back here, which is metric. And I prefer to have everything in English, that's what I can, or SAE. Uh, I bought that from a company out of Omaha. that pump new, I don't remember what it cost, but I would say it was probably under 300. So I think I built the whole thing, including the rotary vacuum adapter for uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of four or five hundred or less. Now, in the American Wood Turner, American Wood Turner, there's a uh, vendor that is uh, selling vacuum chucks. Now, I'm not sure, two or three years ago, he was a vendor at our symposium. I do not know if he will be there this year or not. He will not be. But what he does is he goes around and finds different sources of uh, used pumps and tests them out and recycles them and so we get some good equipment at much less cost. So those are, I guess you say, two sources that are not mainstream that uh, you can get some decent equipment. But that vacuum pump, or that filter, is the one that uh, I got when I originally got the system. Uh, some of the reading I've done, people use oil filters, fuel filters, one thing or another. To, uh, for that purpose. And if you have your equipment properly uh, adjusted, you can determine if your vacuum pump is very dirty by how much difference there is between this gauge and that gauge when there's a significant amount of airflow. So 
with this setup, I can tell if I feel like getting in trouble. Any other questions? Okay. Um,
And again, it's a situation that uh, if you can only do things one way, you're limiting yourself. Uh, it looks like I've got a good seal on that chuck. Okay. Now, Pass this around if you want to. I use a Minwax tongue oil uh, finish on most of the stuff I do because I know that it's uh, water resistant and it works real well. Okay, now I use a lot of templates, and if you can get a shot at that, you'll see that in the center of this thing. Uh, I've got a center punch in there, but I do not let it go all the way through. And then I use the step center with the loaded spring pin. And yeah, over time it'll wear, wear through there. I have to replace it, but generally I'll leave it, leave it pretty good shape. Okay, take this thing. This is just a scrap piece of wood. I did use a belt sander and sanded it on one side. And hopefully that will seal reasonably well. Okay, now uh, I'm just holding it with the spring pin. I can adjust this as needed and get the thing in there just exactly where I want it. Then I'll tighten it up and I will apply the back to it. And I'm ready to go. Now, how many of you know what I mean when I say, uh, if I say bevel rubbing? I'm seeing more and more hands. Okay. We are taught to do bevel rubbing. Okay. When you bring your chisel up here, if you'll bevel rub on this coaster, or this template rather, I very carefully size that for four and a half inches. I can not damage my coaster or my template, and I can size the tip of the coaster real easy. So this helps us do things fast. If I screw up and the coaster comes off, then I can use the template to get it back on the correct. Okay, now, <clears throat> I've got it on there. What I would do is I would take my temple off and I would at this point take my gouge and uh, I've got cut down the size, right? I will I typically make them a half inch thick. A ruler is a half inch, so I go in there and I mark it a half inch and I would clean that off. And then I would hollow it out. Now uh, one thing that I made a mistake on when I was first doing it is that I made this brim too thin. If you make it too thin and you drop it, you get a chip. So leave that brim relatively thick so that when you drop it, it'll survive better. A um, guy asked me the other day, why four and a half inches. I have a big coffee mug. It fits the coffee mug. You make it whatever size you want. Okay, now. There we go. Now, I make the Make the coaster a half inch thick, and I've got a depth gauge that I set at a quarter of an inch. And uh, while the thing is on there, I can take this gauge and put it on there, and I can go across and find out where the high spots and low spots are. You see that? Okay, so that gives me a uniform thickness. I can make it fairly flat 
and I'm even wondering that with this particular uh, chuck, that it is small enough that I can actually round over this back side. So I can completely finish this thing uh, with one mount. Okay? Questions? Make good Christmas presents, birthday presents, so forth. Okay, now, one of the things that I have done is that uh, I will, this is one of the things that's been turned. I've hollowed it out, and it's the right thickness, and it's the right diameter, but I want something a little bit more interesting than just that plain surface. Okay? So, what I do, let's turn this off. Okay, when I made this, you'll notice that there is a center hole, center punch, and I had it mounted on the lathe, and when I cut it out of the bandsaw, I wasn't very careful. Uh, I made it as big as I could, roughly circular, mounted it on the lathe, and let the lathe make it round. The lathe is good at that. Okay, so I got my blank, I've got it hollowed out, and what I want to do is mount that on there. So, the double-sided tape, uh, you want to put out close to the perimeter. Uh, the foot in the center doesn't do any good. Now, I've got double-sided tape on there, and I just 
go down here and it's not a precision thing that needs to be done. Now, I went off and uh, made some templates of the pattern that I want. This is one I used in the past. This is one I used this week. So I just take graph paper and I do my four and a half inch circle. I put my other uh, units in there like I want and I lay that on there like so. And this is the thing I learned to believe. So, the difference being though that uh, Lee was not using it did not have it using any kind of vacuum to just use a manual. So we would use the template to put the device on there and then we'd have to move it around each other. So if I put that on the center, there we go. Like so. Now I just got the center pin holding in place. You see that's not very well lined, is it? So I can take this and I can use my fingers and move it around. I know the template's aligned. Now I got this line there and I can tighten it up. Now, one other thing, uh, you notice this little arrow I've got up here. That's a good news. So what I want to do is take a pencil or a magic marker or something and put a mark on my disc to line up with that. And one of the things that Lee taught us was to the double-sided tape, put pressure on it. And put pressure on it long enough that it will adhere. If you don't do it, long enough it will uh, it was one in here right. I've heard rumors that uh, well this is double sided tape that they sell out of here uh, for wood turning specifically. Uh, I bought this roll of tape about five, six years ago. I still haven't used it up. I've heard that stuff like the double sided tape they use under carpets does not hold it. Okay, now I can turn the vacuum on and I've got a new vacuum on. It's pulling 20 inches again. Now if you look at this, you probably notice the white on the back side. When I first did this, I just used masonite. It leaked like a sieve. And this is in a whiteboard, recycling it, and it holds a whole lot better. What is that again? Whiteboard? What is that? What is that material? It's, if you have a, a Home Depot and you get uh, their section where they've got cut pieces of plywood and particle board and this, that, and the other. This was specifically for whiteboards, like they got up there. And they had others there that are blackboards. Now, I don't care about marking on it, but it holds a vacuum. It doesn't leak. That's why I was interested in. Okay. Now, it makes a difference uh, the order in which you make your cuts on these things. Now this one right here is the pattern I've got here. Okay, So I'm going to do the four outside ones first and then do the center one. If I did the center one first and then did the four outside ones, the center one would disappear. Now, along that line, when you do something like this trivet, uh, you'll notice I started in the center here and went out with smaller discs. I can use that same pattern and start on the outside and come in and 
the locations are the same, but the difference in sequence makes it look entirely different. Okay? Um, okay. Now, what I will do at this point, I hope that's set up. I will take this loose. I'm going to turn off the tire. I will take this loose. this over to where I'm going for my first end line. I don't know if anybody else is crazy enough to try this. 
But the guys down in Denver really found it interesting. What's that? What I'm doing the um, uh, portion of it uh, depends upon what your lane is. Now, one of the ways I've got one go down to uh, 300 RPM, the other one go down to about uh, three, three RPM. So I run slow so that I don't tear anything up. Other questions? Okay. The uh, the other one I'm going to do you. What's that? I didn't understand. Now this this allows me to offset things and move it around. Now. Uh, Several years ago, I was, did a demo on here using uh, offset inlays, and it probably YouTube on it. I don't know if we're doing YouTube there or not, but it was quite a bit more involved, took a lot longer, and wasn't near as friendly as this is. But again, it's leveraged off of some of the stuff that uh, uh, Lee taught us. You notice I had to pull on it. If I had tried sliding it sideways, it would come off a whole lot easier. One of the things you got to recognize is, yeah, the air pressure is putting 160 pounds. No, this is the last probably 100 pounds that way. But the only thing that's keeping it from moving sideways is friction. So uh, coefficient of friction on that is probably 0.5. So if you've got 100 pounds that way, you've only got 50 pounds this way. You can quite often, if you've got something flat like this, you can quite often just pull it off sideways. So vacuum chucking will do a lot of good things for you, but you've got to be careful. Which way I've got about five minutes. Yeah. Uh, I will tease you with an idea. I've got a journal article out there called Compliant Vacuum Chucking. And uh, basically, here is a vacuum chuck that I built using Trex. And uh, on the inside of it, I've got a filter. Uh, this is a drain plug. You put uh, screen wire over it and uh, put that in there and then this is kind of moves around a little bit. It's got a bag in there full of rice. And what happens is that when you put this on the blade and you pull a vacuum on it, the uh, material here, I use uh, this stuff, which is the uh, material they use for wrapping packages and pallets and so on, or shipping. Uh, this is basically heavy duty saran wrap. It works great. And you wrap that on there, and you wrap it in the direction such as when it's turning, the air does not unwrap it. Okay, get it on there, you can pull a vacuum on it, and it will work real well. And then when I mount the thing up, I was turned using this technique because if you'll notice there's no tenons, holes, anything on the bottom. So it was setting on there like that. And uh, that allows you to do some neat things with it. 
Now, part of the challenge on this is getting it oriented just right. And what I learned is that I can take, like this piece here, uh, if I have it sitting on the, on the table, you see it's kind of crooked. If I take that over to the lathe, our drill press, and I drill a hole in there, straight down, that's the axis that I want the thing to be in. So then, I just take a bolt and screw in there, and that will uh, identify the axis of rotation that I want to do what I want to do. Okay, so you see how it's, that's still sticking straight up in the air. So when I put it over here on my compliant <coughs> chuck, I have an idea of how it needs to be aligned. Now, in order to make that easy on myself, there's two ways that you can do that. Now, think of it as this being on the lathe. You're going to put it on there, and you're going to line it up just right. And you want to line it up a particular way. Uh, one way of doing it is to hook this with your Jacob's chuck. And that's going to line that thing up just exactly the way you want. Uh, there's another way of doing it. Like I told you before, I'm a toolaholic. I've got all sorts of tools, toys. Uh, this is Robert so Sorby uh, Deluxe Revolving Center Stem, Center System. It's hollow, number two, Morse taper. So take that, and they've got all sorts of little adapters in here for you to do things with. Well, I use the one that's hollow. So I can take that, put it right on there. Now that I put that in my tailstock, that forces it to be lined up just exactly the way I want it. And I take that and I jam it into this chuck and I will apply a small vacuum on it and I will arrange things around make sure everything gets good. The main criteria is that you don't want any part of this wood touching this solid rim because then it prevents you from holding it just the way you want it. So you go through and you do that. At this point what we're primarily interested in is getting this surface flat and at the right rim that we want. Okay. Uh, then we want to hollow it out. Somebody asked how to hollow that out. Okay. Uh, how many old timers we got here that's heard of, of donut chucks? Okay. Basically, what I'm doing is I'm making a donut chuck. So if you Consider that this thing is setting there like that, and you've got your live center holding it in place, like so. And that's in the tailstock. What you can do is you can take these guys and fit them over there like that. And now, recognize that's been flattened off. So now we've got us a donut chuck. And you can take your take your threaded rods and run them down through here. And you notice down here on this chuck, uh, I've got some holes down there. They've got threads in them. So you can take this thing and you can uh, put a series of these things in there and uh, you get it held in place, crank it down, then you take this off and you take your bolt out and you go after it and haul it out, however you want to. That's fast and furious, but that's what it's working. Now, 
well, this is something I'm going to do another journal article on. Now, there are several things about this that I'm not real happy with, and I've got an idea as to how to fix them. Uh, one of the things is that uh, when you get this screwed down tight, there's typically a bolt sticking up here. Uh, it, I haven't gotten hung up on it, but it could be quite interesting if I did that. So uh, I've got some ideas as to how I can make this more friendly, more adjustable, and not have this big thing sticking out here. If some of you want to try some of these techniques, uh, come over and we can uh, explore the ideas. The other thing is that uh, the way this is set up right now, I'm limited on the size of the blank, and the techniques that I'm thinking about right now, I can overcome that, and I can overcome the hazard of these bolts sticking out. Then when you get through, you turn the thing over, and you stick it on the standard vacuum chuck, and you finish up turning the outside. Then if you want to, you can do a little bit on the bottom. Questions? That's a whirlwind trip. Anybody have having information overload problems? <laughs> Let's give John a big hand.